Welcome to another collection of Horrible Fates. By coincidence, the final two stories in today's video took place over a hundred years ago, but just a few months from one another. In one of the stories, the monster is human, in the other, not so much. I'll leave it to you to decide which is worse. As a warning, the stories in today's video are also very gruesome. As a result of this, viewer discretion is advised. This video is brought to you by Babbel, one of the top language learning apps in the world. Last time I talked about Babbel on this channel, I had just started using the app to brush up on my French after I was embarrassed by how difficult it had become to pronounce the French names in my videos. But since I started using the app, I have now progressed back to the nitty gritty of verb conjugations and gendered word pronunciations, which I hated doing in school, but thankfully I see much more value in now. Here's an example of how Babbel verifies my speech in real time. Original, original. Original, original. The coolest thing about Babbel, though, is that it has me go through a series of different ways to learn the same concepts similar to how I was taught in school. And this is because all of Babbel's lessons were designed by real language teachers. It's hard to overstate just how powerful this is in accelerating your learning and teaching you to have real world conversations. And the best part about this is that when I'm away from my computer, I can do all of the lessons from the Babbel app on my phone. With all of these features, it's been super easy and enjoyable to brush up on my French speaking, so I'm curious to hear what languages all of you would want to learn, because right now, Babbel is offering 60% off a subscription for all Scary Interesting viewers, and this comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. So there's no risk in giving it a try with the link on screen now or in the description below, or with the holidays coming up and everyone traveling, it might be the perfect gift for your friends and family. Et maintenant, la vidéo d'aujourd'hui. That means, and now for today's video. In March of 2013, two brothers, Jeff and Jeremy, lived together in a home in Tampa Bay, Florida. And by all accounts, the two of them got along really well. They lived together to save on housing costs, they spent tons of time together, and they even worked together at the same workplace. Basically, the only time they weren't together was when they were sleeping. One night after work, each of them had gone to their separate rooms to get ready to go to sleep, but they hadn't fallen asleep just yet. All of a sudden, Jeremy hears what sounds like a car crash a few rooms over, and his brother Jeff starts screaming. He bounced out of bed, ran to the door, whipped the door open, and sprinted over to his brother's room. Then he practically kicked his brother's door open, but when he did, there was just a massive hole in the ground where his brother's room used to be, meaning the bed, the dresser, the TV, and even Jeff were somewhere inside this large pit in the floor. The only thing left were the TV cables that were now running directly down from where the TV was plugged in into this pit. Now, if you're from Florida, you might know about this, but for those of you who don't know, the type of land that Florida is makes it very prone to sinkholes. In fact, Jeff and Jeremy's house is located in an area known as Sinkhole Alley, where sinkholes are way more frequent than anywhere else in the state. Groundwater slowly erodes these massive holes underground, and sometimes these are not obvious until a building collapses into them. These are actually so common in Florida that state law even requires home insurers to provide special coverage against damage due to sinkholes. And by the time the earth was eroded enough to actually collapse, the sinkhole under Jeff and Jeremy's house had grown to be 20 feet across and over 30 feet deep. Eventually, the concrete floor underneath the house gave way and swallowed up everything inside, including Jeff. Upon seeing this massive hole in the ground and his brother nowhere to be found, Jeremy jumped into the hole after his brother and tried desperately to get him out, despite knowing that this sinkhole was still growing larger and the ground was still collapsing around it. But this didn't matter at all to Jeremy. The only thing he'd think about was saving his brother. He dug and dug, trying to find his brother in the rubble while someone else in the house called emergency services. As they waited for police to arrive, someone got Jeremy a shovel, so he was literally standing at the bottom of the pit, digging frantically, trying to uncover his brother, who he could swear was calling for help somewhere in the rubble. Finally, the police arrived, and with how dangerous it was for Jeremy to still be in the sinkhole, the police pulled him out and then evacuated the house and the two houses on either side. And as much as everyone wanted to mount a rescue and find Jeff, knowing there might be an air pocket and that he might be alive somewhere, it was just too dangerous to get anywhere near the edges. As days went by, slowly, hope was abandoned of finding Jeff alive. Eventually, special equipment was brought in to detect any signs of life from down in the pit, but unfortunately, they found nothing. Then, due to the risk it posed to anyone in the area, the house was demolished along with the two houses on either side. The pit was then filled in with Jeff's remains somewhere inside because his body was just never located. It is now fenced off to ensure no one else gets swallowed alive like Jeff. Frank Lloyd Wright is often considered the greatest architect in American history. 
In his 70-year career, he was involved in the construction of at least a thousand structures across the US and Japan, many of which are still standing today. In addition to design work, he was a writer and a teacher and influenced an entire generation of architects because he had hundreds of apprentices throughout his career. One specific feature that Frank Lloyd Wright was known for was his ability to really integrate the buildings with the surrounding environment. One of the greatest examples of this is his famous construction, Falling Water, in Pennsylvania. This beautiful slab construction built into the cliffside has been called the greatest all-time work in American architecture. But despite all these accomplishments, like everyone else, Frank was a complicated individual. Great accomplishments don't necessarily mean a person is a great person, just like one bad deed doesn't necessarily mean someone is a bad person. In 1903, he was contracted by one of his neighbors, Edwin Cheney, to design a home for Edwin and his family. During the time he spent with Edwin, he became infatuated with Edwin's wife, Mama Borthwick Cheney. Mama was an early feminist and a great intellect, and Frank was attracted to this and stated that he felt that she was his equal intellectually. And clearly, Mama was also attracted to Frank because sometime after, the two of them started to have an affair. And it wasn't long before this affair was found out and became a public scandal. As their previous relationships fell apart, this new relationship became more serious, and the two of them were seen out in public and on trips across the US and Europe, away from their spouses and children. Eventually, Edwin granted Mayma a divorce, but Frank's wife wouldn't do the same for him. In addition to that, because of the negative press the couple was receiving, they decided to move away from the area to live together in privacy. Frank's wife would keep the home in Oak Park, and the new couple moved to a new home in Wisconsin designed by Frank. This house would come to be known as the Taliesin. It was actually a bit more of an estate than a home because it was a large complex on 600 acres of property owned by Frank's family. As Frank's designs were known for, the home incorporated the flatness of the plains and limestone outcroppings in the surrounding area. And although they had been together for years at this point, it wasn't until the year 1911 that the home was finally fully finished. In addition to the physical size of the home, it had a team of individuals to keep it operational, including handymen, housekeepers, and cooks. And although Frank's work struggled a bit during this period, due to the negative press from the affair, the couple was otherwise very happy. Their children often visited the Wisconsin home, and Frank still frequently traveled for different projects. As per usual, in August of 1914, Frank was away on one of these projects in Chicago, and because Mama's kids were off school, they were visiting her that month to spend some time with her. On the 15th, at about midday, all three of them were sitting on the veranda of the home, getting ready to be served lunch. One of the helpers, a man named Julian Carlton, went around the table and gave each of them some soup. First to 8-year-old Martha, then to 12-year-old John, and then to Mama. Julian then left the room to serve the staff in another room. A few rooms over was the main dining area, which was a large 25-foot room with a large dining table running its length. Julian then served all the workers in this room and then closed the door and told his wife, who was a cook at the estate, to go outside and wait for him. Julian then walked to the utility closet and grabbed a shingling hatchet and returned to the veranda and then proceeded to kill Mama with a single blow to the head. Then he turned his attention to John next and then to Martha, who had run out of the door and into the courtyard. He quickly caught up to her and finished her off as well and then went back inside the home and grabbed some gasoline. Then he poured some gas on each of the bodies and let them on fire. Then he walked around the house and poured more gas on the rugs and curtains and then lit them on fire as well. Inside the dining room, as the men ate, one of them noticed what looked like water being splashed underneath the door. The door then burst into flames and trapped the men inside of the room. Two of the men farthest from the door ran to the windows and started hitting and kicking them and managed to break the glass. One of them jumped out, breaking his arms in the fall, and the other, who was on fire by this point, landed without getting hurt but quickly rolled down the hillside to put out the flames on his body. Before they could even react, Julian came running and knocked one of them unconscious with the back of the hatchet. Then he went back to the dining room where the fire had now been extinguished and proceeded to go man to man with the hatchet in an attempt to finish everyone off. Thinking everyone was dead, Julian then left the room, went down into the basement where he entered a panel leading into the furnace and then swallowed a vial of hydrochloric acid. The two men who jumped out of the window then ran to the farmhouse section of the estate and called the police to tell them what happened. They then returned to the main section and tried desperately to put out the fire, but despite their efforts, the house was slowly engulfed in flames over the next three hours. When Julian was finally found several hours later, the police were barely able to prevent him from being killed on the spot by an angry crowd before he was taken to jail. Julian's wife was found outside the home in a nearby field, entirely unaware of Julian's intentions or what had taken place inside the home. She was dressed in nice travel clothes, and as far as she knew, that day was Julian's last day working in the home, and the two planned to travel for Julian to find new work. Several months earlier, Julian and his wife had been hired to work in the home by Frank and Mama. At the time, Julian was super friendly and likable, but over time, his temper revealed itself as he got into arguments with other workers and even Frank and Mama. 
These got worse and worse, and Julian got increasingly paranoid during this time, to the point that every night when he was going to sleep, he had a weapon in his bed. At the same time, Frank and Mema had finally had enough of these confrontations and served Julian with a letter officially ending his employment on August 15th. Then, on the 15th, Julian waited until the two groups were in separate rooms, where he then put his plan into place. Unfortunately, the hydrochloric acid had not been sufficient to kill Julian as he intended, it only severely burned his esophagus. But before he could be tried for the events of that day, he died of starvation 47 days following the incident. During that time, he never once talked to police, so his true motives have never been fully determined. Hokkaido is the second largest Japanese island after the main island Honshu and is actually almost 40% of its size. It is also the northernmost Japanese island and the least densely populated of any of the 47 prefectures. And unlike the mainland, where Usuri brown bears have been hunted to extinction, Hokkaido still has a population of around 3,000 brown bears living across the island. This is actually more than what are thought to live in the entire continental United States. And this specific subspecies can grow almost to as large as the famously massive Kodiak grizzlies. At dawn in mid-November 1915 in a small pioneering village on the northwestern edge of Hokkaido, one of these bears was spotted on a family farm. The bear was standing on the edge of their property eating some of the corn cane when one of their horses noticed it and got spooked. When it got spooked, it started bucking and neighing loudly, causing the bear to head back into the woods. Now, given the area they were in, it wasn't unexpected to see wildlife or even bears. What was unexpected were how big the paw prints were that the bear left in the snow. The head of the family even remarked that these were the largest bear prints he'd ever seen. A few days later, on November 20th, the bear returned to the family's farm, likely in search of more food. It didn't stay long and quickly wandered off, but because it had come back, it was a bit more concerning. Worried that it might continue this pattern of behavior, it could potentially attack one of the horses or steal more of his crops, so the head of the family decided to hire two local hunters to stake out his property. There were no more sightings until the evening of November 30th, when the man heard some rustling outside. He and the hunters looked and saw the massive bear standing on its hind legs and eating some of the crops. After carefully aiming, the hunters managed to get one shot off before the bear ran off into the woods. With it being dark out, they couldn't really go after the bear that night, so they'd have to track it down the following day. And although they would find its tracks and even a blood trail from where it was wounded, a storm forced them to turn around when the tracks started to lead them up into the mountains. But this blood trail was simultaneously reassuring because they figured that because it had been hurt, it would be too scared to return to the farm. With how far north Hokkaido is, and especially where this village is located near the mountains, the winters are harsh and snow falls already in the early fall. Once the rivers start to freeze, it makes it difficult to travel across them because the ice isn't solid enough to walk across yet, but there's still too much ice to use boats. Instead, the villagers make something known as an ice bridge where logs are placed across the river, then snow and dirt are thrown over the logs, and then river water is used to freeze it and make it stable. The men of the village take turns building different sections and occasionally all meet together to make the final preparations. December 9th of that year was one of these occasions and 13 of the 15 men in the village were supposed to meet and finish the construction of one of these bridges. A man named Ota said bye to his wife, Meiyu, and their toddler, Mikio, and then set off for work. He got to his friend's house shortly after and then the two of them walked down to the river. On the way there, they passed by another farm and saw that a big pile of crops had been eaten and there were large bear prints all over the place. The men talked about how this bear would be a great source of meat because of how large it was and then continued walking. This interaction kind of demonstrates just how common it was to see wildlife in the area. Later that day, Ota returned home and walked inside and noticed that the house was kind of quiet. Across the one-room house, he could see Mikio hunched over, not really moving, so he called out to him, but Mikio didn't answer. Ota walked over to him and as he got closer, he could see there was blood across his face. Then he picked him up and saw that part of his neck had been torn out and there was an obvious bite mark on his head. That's when he realized that the house had been torn apart. There was dirt all over the place, food everywhere, and bloody handprints on the floor. He called out to his wife next, but she was nowhere to be found, so he ran back to the worksite and frantically explained to everyone what had happened. At this point, they still had no idea what was going on, just that there was some sort of scuffle and Mayo was now missing. All of the village men returned to the house, and that's when they realized it was a bear attack. There were large clumps of hair in and around the window, which led them to believe that the bear had been attracted to the smell coming from the window. It then entered the home and mauled Mayu and Mikio, and then dragged Mayu out through the window after the attack. Unfortunately, because of how late it was, they couldn't go after the bear, they'd have to wait until morning. At 9am the following morning, a search party set off into the forest. Only about 500 feet in, they noticed what looked like large roots protruding from the base of one of the trees. As they got closer, this startled the bear, which is what they were actually seeing, and the bear charged at the men. 
They took aim and tried to fire, but because of their poorly maintained guns, many of them misfired, and only one of them was able to get a shot off that missed anyway. The bear swiped the men once, but because of how large their group was, it quickly fled into the woods after that. The group then searched near where the bear was resting, and tragically, buried in the snow were Maya's remains. Only part of her skull was left, and parts of her legs in the brown pants she was wearing the day before. This confirmed that this was the bear who had attacked Ota's house, and even more ominously in the minds of the men, that the bear now had a taste for human flesh. With its incredible sense of smell, the bear could easily track May's remains back to the village, and was now more likely than ever to prey on humans. That night, the majority of the villagers gathered at two spots. Some were at Ota's home, waiting for the bear to come back, and many of the women and children were at a neighbor's house. Then, right at around 8pm, right on cue, the bear came out of the woods at Ota's home. The villagers shot at it and chased after it down near the river, which looked to be the direction the bear went. This drew the attention of the men guarding the women and children, who then left to see what all the commotion was. This left 11 individuals inside of the home completely unprotected, and the bear had not headed in the direction everyone thought it had. 20 minutes later, the bear returned, this time to the neighbor's house. Once again, it entered through the window, this time knocking over the cooking pot and oil lantern, which doused the fire and put out any lights in the house. The bear then proceeded to maul everyone inside the home. One of the women was pregnant and had a child on her back, and when she tried to flee, another of her children grabbed onto her leg, causing her to trip and fall, and prevented her from evading the bear. Upon hearing her screams, the one guard still left at the house ran inside, and the bear turned its attention towards him. It chased him around the home and mauled his back, and when it was done with him, it proceeded to go from person to person. Thankfully, a few individuals managed to escape from the chaos, and one of them ran in the direction of the guards. After losing the bear's trail, the guards were also on their way back when they met up with that person. They explained what had happened and ran back to the house, and on the way there, they came up with a plan to trap the bear. This time, the bear was cornered. Ten of them would line up at the front door, ready to fire, and the others would make a bunch of noise at the back of the house and drive the bear toward the front and into the waiting arms of the men's rifles. When they finally got to the house, everything was so quiet they even debated simply setting the house on fire. But the woman who came to get them protested because she knew that people could still be alive inside. So instead, the men got into their positions and started yelling and screaming from behind the house. And as they expected, the bear ran out the front door, but in the chaos, more of the guns misfired. And because of the way the bear ran, there was a risk of crossfire. So yet again, the bear escaped into the woods. In this attack, five more individuals were mauled to death. The bear had been inside and eating them when the guards arrived. The following day, the village was absolutely devastated. This prompted someone to alert the nearest authorities, and while they waited for help to come, a day went by without any sightings of the bear. By the following day, a sniper team was sent over from a nearby police station. These were six individuals who were trained and their equipment was maintained. All they had to do was wait for the bear to reappear. One more day went by without incident, so the team devised a plan to lure the bear out of the woods. They desperately needed to take care of this problem before anyone else was attacked, so despite the villagers' resistance to the idea, they used the remains of one of the recently deceased to lure the bear out. That evening, the team of police snipers set up inside the neighbor's home and waited for the bear to come out from the woods. And in fact, right around dusk, the bear made its way out to the home but seemed to sense that something was wrong. It circled the home a few times and then wandered back into the woods without ever entering. But then the following morning, they found that Ota's house had been raided again. Sometime during the night, the bear had come back out of the forest and eaten all of the food Ota had stockpiled for the winter. Increasingly frustrated and desperate to end this once and for all, an order came from the local government to simply go into the forest and hunt the bear down. They just couldn't take any more chances having the bear around the village. It was time to end this. After searching all day, they returned to the village, but then one of the search parties saw something across the river. With how dark it was, they couldn't quite make out if it was a bear or a person, so they called out, and as soon as there was no reply, they fired at the area. And very quickly, they realized it was the bear, who then took off running deeper into the woods. Once again, the bear evaded the men. The following morning, when searching that area, they found that the bear had actually been hit by one of the shots, because there was a trail of blood. This meant that it was now or never. It was wounded, they had a trail, and they had a large group to go after it. Not wanting to wait until another storm rolled into the area and covered its tracks, they set off immediately into the woods on the bear's trail, and quickly they found the bear resting underneath an oak tree. They got about 60 feet away as stealthily as possible and then fired two shots. The first impacted the bear's heart, and the second directly into his head. Finally, the rampage had come to an end. When the bear was finally measured, the villagers found that it was 750 pounds and almost 9 feet tall. Incredibly, some Missouri bears can get to 1,200 pounds, almost double the weight of that bear. 
It's hard to imagine what might have happened had the bear been bigger, because as far as I can find, this is the single deadliest series of bear attacks in recorded history. Following the deaths of the seven individuals, many of the villagers slowly left the town, and eventually, Sankebetsu turned into a ghost town. There is now a memorial shrine in the area where the incident took place, honoring all of the individuals whose lives were lost in the attack. Hello everyone, my name is Sean, and welcome to Scary Interesting. Just so you know, there is now a Scary Interesting subreddit where you can post story suggestions or anything else. It's much easier for me to sort through them this way. Thank you so much for watching, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.